the anniversary of Gerard's well-deserved Nobel Prize. I wish I could be there. Um, I can't. It's gotten a little bit hard for me to, to travel, but uh, I'm here in spirit anyway. What I want to talk about is the relation between gravity and quantum mechanics, and a viewpoint that I think is gaining some traction, at least among uh, some of the community of physicists doing quantum mechanics and gravity. It's what I call GRQM. And the idea is that many of the properties of gravity emerge from parallel properties of quantum mechanics, properties that are shared by all quantum systems. And certain limits emerge as recognizable gravitational phenomena. The key to all of these correspondences is the holographic principle. Let me start with the as such correspondence. According to the classical equation, the classical equation of motion of relativity, when a black hole is disturbed, its area always grows. What is the parallel quantum mechanical phenomena? This is, of course, the quantum version of the second law of thermodynamics. Why the quantum version? Well, just recall the formula for the entropy. The entropy is proportional to the area, but the interesting factor here is the 1 over h power in the denominator. In the classical limit, the entropy of any black hole, no matter how small it is, is infinite. To say that the entropy increases is just ill-defined. It's quantum mechanics which makes it meaningful. As I said, this was the first indication of a close parallel between the laws of quantum mechanics and the laws of gravity. Now, let me begin with a conjecture. The conjecture is that there's no obstruction to engineering a strongly coupled large N gauge theory on a shell of silicon. Well, it doesn't have to be silicon but a shell of matter and turning it to a quantum. Uh -oh. Simulating it, but simulating it in a quantum computer. All right, here is my picture of a silicon ball or a silicon sphere, a shell. And if I look closely at it, I discover that it's made up of a large number of little processors, huge number of little processors, all interconnected on a lattice that covers a sphere. These processors could just be atoms, or they could be um, processors that have a large number of degrees of freedom on them, but still a fraction of the entire sphere, and the sphere is covered by them. We can even think of it as a, a spherical shell quantum computer. And let's add Alice. Alice is the experimenter in the laboratory, and she is equipped with devices that allow her to perturb the shell. A hammer is one possibility, I won't recommend it. A laser, or electrodes, or other experimental uh, techniques to communicate with the shell, to perturb it. And also, a listening device, or many listening devices, which allows her to hear or to sense phonons, spin-ons, or whatever the uh, excitations on the, on the ship are, and so allows her to communicate with the shell. Alice's first experiment will be to heat up the shell a little bit. She puts a flame under it, or some other method, perhaps illuminates it with a laser, and in that way heats it up, fills up the shell with lots of quanta, so that the shell becomes a thermal shell. According to gauge gravity duality, ADS CFT, if this is a good quantum field theory of the kind that, uh, that has a good gravitational dual, then Alice has two ways of describing this, communicating with it and describing what she senses. One of them is just that the shell is full of heat. The other is that there is a black hole at the center of the shell in the bulk. How can she test this out? Can she test this out? In particular, can she test out the idea that there's a black hole there? Well, she can send signals to the shell. She can send signals to the shell, tapping on it. Perhaps they can be high-frequency signals so that they follow trajectories 
that um, that are given by geometrical optics. And in fact, the, um, elsewhere on this show is listening. He will hear those shells. He will hear those signals. And in fact, he will discover that they are focused exactly at the place where a trajectory in the presence of a black hole would wind up near the boundary of the, would wind up at the shell. So Alice can confirm the idea that there's a black hole in the center by sending signals which Bob can receive, and Bob discovers that they focus exactly at the right. The black hole can be changed. She can add some more heat. A bigger black hole. This is someplace else. Bob has to move. And what does he discover? Always that the signal focuses precisely where gravity, where a black hole would have a signal focus. In that way, Alice can do many, many experiments on this black hole, or whatever happens to be uh, uh, holographically described by the shell. She can do experiments, communicate with it, and learn what's on the inside. She can discover that there are gravitons. She can discover all kinds of things. Now let me move on to the ER equals EPR idea. The ER equals EPR idea begins with Alice and Bob each having their own shell in the laboratory. They can each illuminate their shells with laser beams. The green little lines there are supposed to be laser beams. The laser beams can heat the shell, and so they can each have a black hole. But so far, they're entirely independent black holes. Let's suppose that instead, the shells are heated in another way, a single laser whose beam goes through a, what is called a spontaneous parametric down conversion. All that means is each photon is split into two, and those two photons are entangled. We illuminate the shells with entangled photon pairs. The black holes become entangled, or the shells become entangled, but we can interpret that as the energy stored in those black holes is entangled or is entangled, uh, quantum mechanically entangled. If that is the case, then according to ER equals EPR, there is not only a pair of entangled black holes, but those entangled black holes are connected. They're connected by an Einstein-Rosen bridge. This is the Penrose diagram describing such an Einstein-Rosen bridge. And it describes a quantum state which is highly entangled. It may not be the easiest thing in the world to create exactly the state, but if Alice and Bob can create a thermal field double state, then they have exactly a pair of black holes connected by an Einstein-Rosen bridge. In fact, an Einstein-Rosen bridge of the simplest kind Here's what Einstein wrote like. It connects two distant places, perhaps not too distant, but somewhat distant, in Alice and Bob's lab. They can go around the outside. In other words, they can go from one black hole to the other through the laboratory. But if the article's EPR is correct, then what that means is they also have available a wormhole connecting them. Now, what can they do with that wormhole? Oh, before I say that, let me say some parallels between Einstein-Rosen bridges and entanglement. First of all, wormholes can only be created or destroyed locally. <coughs> that means, <coughs> excuse me, if you want to create a wormhole, a pair of wormholes connecting to uh, black holes, you can only do it locally. If you want to separate the black holes afterwards, you can do that. Similarly, entanglement can only be created locally destroyed locally. You can separate systems if they're entangled, but you cannot entangle them if they're far from each other. That's, those are parallels. Another parallel is the no signaling idea. Entanglement does not allow superluminal communication, despite what you might have read in, in the newspaper. Entanglement is a form of correlation, but it does not allow uh, superluminal communication. It doesn't allow signals to be sent through the entangled channel. channel. Similarly, wormholes are non-traversable and do not allow superluminal communication.
<laughs> Einstein Rosen Bridge, connecting Alice and Bob. What can they do with it? Well, here they are. Can Alice send Bob a signal through the wormhole? The signal could be a tennis ball or a photon or whatever you like. And the answer is no. We'll come to the reason why in a moment. But what they can do is, in principle, they can both jump into the black holes and meet at the center. You may not want to do that. It wouldn't be healthy for you. You would eventually get the singularity. But in principle, that's what general relativity says. Why is it that Alice can't send a signal through the wormhole to Bob? And the reason is that Einstein Rosen bridges or wormholes grow rapidly. This is the Penrose diagram showing a, first of all, a pair of black holes connected uh, through entanglement. And we can see that at time t equals zero, the two horizons are touching each other. As time goes on, we can see that the distance between those two, uh, between, or the distance through the wormhole grows. Particular slices through the Penrose diagram called maximal slices would allow you to define the wormhole geometry at an instant of time. And it's clear from the diagram that the wormhole grows. In fact, it grows with the speed of light, or it asymptotes to the speed of light. Okay, let's take a wormhole. What does it do? It grows. Let's go back. Do it again. I like the way. <laughs> That's the pattern of uh, geometry of a growing wormhole. One more. I think that's the last one. All right, let's see why Alice can't send the message to Bob. The red little circle is the message, and she starts trying to send it, but the wormhole grows, and it inevitably defeats her effort to send the signal through the wormhole. So the growth of wormholes is closely connected with the inability to send signals through them. But Alice and Bob can meet. Hello. Here's the Penrose diagram that describes this. Alice tries to send a message to Bob. The wormhole is non-traversable and simply winds up in a singularity. On the other hand, Alice and Bob can both jump into the wormhole. It's a geometric fact. They can both jump into the wormhole and they can meet at the center. So the growth of wormholes plays a, a fundamental role in uh, the no signaling idea and connects it with the idea that signaling cannot be sent through entangled channels. What's the quantum mechanical counterpart of the growing size of the wormhole? Hint, it's not entropy. Entropy is not the thing which is growing which parallels the growth of the wormhole. In fact, the entropy of the two black holes in the thermal field double state are fixed and finite and don't grow. What is it? It appears to be something called quantum computational complexity. Uh, this is an idea that comes from computer science, computational complexity, but it's entered into black hole physics, and in particular, it's entered into the idea that the growth of the interior of a black hole really represents, or is parallel to, or corresponds to, or is dual to, the, the growth of quantum mechanical complexity. So to give you an idea of what quantum mechanical complexity is, let's imagine first an n-bit system. Your computer has n bits. Classical computer. How do you describe the state of an n-bit system? Classical bits, just n binary digits. I could take 400 or 1,000 or uh, maybe uh, 10,000 um, qubits. Sorry, 10,000 bits, and store the uh, the state on uh, 50 pages of paper at most. On the other hand, take a state of an n-qubit system, quantum bits. That state is described by a linear coherent superposition of 2 to the nth quantum states, orthogonal quantum states, and so it takes 2 to the nth complex numbers. That's too much for 400 qubits. That would be too much to store in the entire universe if you pack the universe as tight as it could be packed 
with information, with classical information. And so there's an enormous amount of complexity to a quantum state, or potential complexity to a quantum state, that is simply not, not there for the corresponding classical states. Okay, what exactly is meant by computational complexity of a state? It is the minimum number of quantum gates that are needed to prepare it. Now, I'm assuming that the system is something like a system of qubits, and the minimum number of gates means the number of two qubit operations. They could be three qubit operations, that's not important. The minimum number of two qubit operations that can prepare the state. For example, if we start with a thermal field double state, or if we start with a maximally entangled collection of pairs of qubits, that's shown on the left-hand side here, and we allow it to evolve, after a time, the state gets very complex. It would take many, many gates in order to describe it, or in order to evolve it, from the thermal field double state. The complexity of the state is the absolute minimum of the number of gates that it takes to prepare the state. The complexity of quantum states increases with time, especially if the systems are chaotic. Black holes are chaotic, many, many quantum circuits are chaotic, and the general rule of thumb is the rate of change of a complexity is, first of all, proportional to the entropy of the system. That basically means the number of qubits. Complexity is extensive, so it's proportional to the number of degrees of freedom, and it has to have a rate associated with it. The rate, simply stated, could be the temperature. So the rate of change of complexity for a simple quantum circuit, and I'll take this to also mean a black hole, is the entropy times the temperature, and if you translate that into general relativity terms, we know entropy is area, temperature is whatever it is, it turns out that the complexity is the volume of the wormhole divided by Newton's constant divided by the ADS radius of the dual ADS system that it's describing. All right, so that's a fundamental new idea, I think, that the interior of black holes is governed by, in particular, the growth of the interior of black holes is governed by the rate of growth of complexity. There's a second law of complexity. Complexity is in many ways like entropy. It is not entropy, but it is in many ways like entropy. It tends to grow. In fact, it tends to grow according to a second law. The second law simply says that it tends to grow. If it's small, it will tend to grow, and if you follow the complexity of a typical quantum circuit, it will grow for a long period, exponentially long in the entropy of the system, and then flatten out when it reaches some saturation value. It's a kind of equilibrium that it attains. Eventually, any quantum system will come to a kind of equilibrium, which is not thermal equilibrium. It's much more fine-grained than thermal equilibrium, and it takes a very, very long time simply because quantum states have such an enormous capacity for complexity. On the same plot, I've drawn where thermal equilibrium sets in, and that's at a tiny, tiny fraction of the time that it takes for complexity equilibrium to set in. So that says, what that says is that classical general relativity can be trusted, but not for indefinite amounts of time. After a time of order exponential in the entropy, complexity, and if the conjecture is right, the volume of wormholes has to stop growing. Okay, question. All of this is about the interior of black holes. Does it have any operational meaning whatever? Does it have any experimental meaning, any empirical meaning? Can the interior of black holes be explored from the outside? Well, the answer is no, unless you can keep black hole, the Einstein-Rosen bridge from growing. If you can't keep it from growing, then you can send messages through it. We know that we can send messages from, through entangled channels, through entangled systems. If the wormhole is representing entanglement, then we know that we can use entanglement to send messages. The protocol is called quantum teleportation. 
The conjecture is that quantum teleportation is equal to the traversability of wormholes. So I want to talk about that a little bit, rather quickly. I don't want to go into any tremendous detail, but I want to talk a little bit about quantum teleportation and how it relates to the traversability of wormholes. First of all, what is quantum teleportation? This picture that's up there shows an entangled pair of particles, the bottom, the V-shaped bottom of the right part of the curve, right part of the picture, represents an entangled pair of particles. We want to send, using the entangled pair of particles, we want to send a message, a quantum message, and that quantum message could be the state of another qubit, a third qubit. And the way that it's done is to combine the first, the message qubit with, let's call it Alice's qubit, Alice's entangled qubit, combine them together, make a measurement, and then broadcast the result of the measurement by classical communication to Bob's end. If Bob receives the message and does the right thing, whatever the right thing is, the right unitary operation of his qubit, out will pop, or his qubit will suddenly be converted to the message qubit. So this is a protocol. It's completely secure. There is no way to eavesdrop on it. And in some sense, the message didn't go through the space between the two qubits. It went through the entangled channel. One can imagine doing this not just with a single qubit pair, but one can imagine doing it with an entangled pair of quantum computers, or even an entangled pair of black holes. For a pair of entangled computers, quantum computers, you begin the state with some highly entangled state, a product of Bell pairs. You add to one of the computers a few new qubits. The few new qubits are representing the message that's going to be teleported through. You do exactly the same thing. You make a measurement, and on the right-hand side, you do whatever the protocol requires you to do, and out pops the system that you sent into the left computer, out it pops out of the right computer. I won't go into details. This has been well studied. That's called quantum teleportation. In this case, quantum teleportation through a channel of a highly entangled system. And by now, it has been connected, closely connected, not with quantum teleportation, but with the traversability of wormholes. The sending back and forth of classical messages seems to have the effect of keeping the wormhole from growing. If the wormhole is prevented from growing, messages can be sent through it. Those messages have been studied, or the process has been studied. It's been studied in ADS-CFT, not the quantum circuits in ADS-CFT, by Gao, Jeffers, and Wall, Malvasena, Stanford, and Yang. And it's known to be connected with the traversability of wormholes. Why? Because the classical messages being sent back and forth somehow prevent the, or slow down, if you like, the growth of the wormhole. Here's the, here's the, we have lost the picture, Stanford.
Rose School and Wallace and Pierce did the same thing. Here's a uh, draw the pattern rose diagram, not using the uh, tray and toss. Can you hear me? Yes. We lost you uh, about a minute and a half ago to the assistant director on our side. Look here. <laughs> what should we do? I think that I think that we, we put a message through the wormhole and, and uh, stopped it growing for some reason. But but that's where we yeah. were in your talk. If you could just back up for a few minutes and then okay. uh, pick it up from there. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. What? One more. One more forward. Do I say? Yes. That's good. Hello, David. Yes, that's good. All right, you didn't hear what I said then. No, no not, we were at Mount Messina, Stanford, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so you threw me off course, and I'm um, a little flustered, but we'll keep going. All right, so quantum teleportation is a protocol which allows you to send messages through quantum channels, which means entangled systems. And it has a parallel in quantum gravity, or ADS-CFT, and that parallel was worked out by Gao Jaffers Wall, Mount Santa Stanford Yang, and uh, it, in fact, turns a pair of entangled black holes into a uh, traversable wormhole. The traversable wormhole is made traversable, again, by the sending back and forth of classical messages from one side to the other, um, or it can also be represented by just introducing a coupling between the two sides. The coupling, not a coupling through the wormhole, but a coupling which is mediated uh, through the laboratory, if you like. Just an interaction between the two black holes, almost any interaction. Well, not almost any interaction. Here's a Penrose diagram describing the gallup jaffers wall model Santa stanford yang effect. Uh, we start with a pair of entangled black holes represented by the Penrose diagram, the square Penrose diagram, and Alice on the left sends in a signal. That's the red line. A little bit later, after a scrambling time, in fact, Alice makes a measurement. She sends that measurement, or the result of the measurement, the bob on the other side. This can all be represented by simply uh, putting in a coupling between the two sides. She sends a message to the other side, and the effect of that message when it's received at the other side is to create a little perturbation, the blue perturbation, which propagates into the black hole. Now, curiously, if they do this correctly, the, uh, the blue perturbation will carry negative energy. Negative energy relative to the thermal state of the black hole. Not relative to the uh, to the um, necessarily to the ground state, but this, but relative to the thermal state of the black hole. In other words, instead of adding some extra particles, a few particles have been taken out. That negative energy or that hole in the energy distribution propagates into the black hole as a kind of shock wave, a negative energy shock wave. The result of the shock wave through the Drey-Tuft effect drag to effect with negative energy is to displace the signal, displace the signal along the shock wave and kick it into the past a little bit. Kicking it into the past makes the wormhole traversable and allows the signal to come out of the black hole. Exactly what we always said can't happen, but it does. Okay. Here's another way of drawing the same Penrose diagram. Instead of using the Drea Tuft effect, we'll simply redraw the Penrose diagram so that all uh, trajectories, all light light trajectories, are lines and they don't get displaced, they don't get pumped. Uh, this is what the Penrose diagram would look like if drawn as a true Penrose diagram. The effect of the coupling between two sides is to tilt inward the, uh, the boundaries of the Penrose diagram. And you can see exactly how that lets a signal go from the left side to the right side. You can also see how it would allow Alice and Bob meeting at the center to get back out and report that they had met in the center. Let's back a step. The lesson of all of this 
is that the interior of black holes are accessible the interiors of black holes are accessible to the outside through the method of quantum teleportation as long as the black holes are close enough to be able to communicate it will send classical messages back and forth now real black holes this of course is a very very difficult it's not something we're going to do with real black holes but with black holes and silicon shells with simulated black holes and silicon shells i believe we can do this in fact i believe we can do it in a laboratory let's come to another correspondence the other correspondence is operator growth scrambling and its relation to gravitational attraction this has been studied widely and it's been studied in the syk theory if you don't know what the syk theory is i'll be very very brief about it it's simply a mini fermion system with a very very generic hamiltonian the most generic hamiltonian you can imagine almost random mini fermion system it's been widely studied by kataev osy and k stands for such dev yeah and kataev and at low temperature this system is holographic it's a it's a holographic system and it describes a near extreme horizon nordstrom black hole with a long ads2 throat with a uniform gravitational field in it that black hole uh this is a representation of a spatial slice of it has this very very long throat before it gets to the horizon the horizon is way off on the left the outer space is way off on the right and this long throat gets longer and longer as the black hole gets nearer and nearer to extramality here's another picture of it i just draw this picture um all right it's a picture of the same thing the black hole was at the center and the center of the ads space the cylinder is the ads space vertical is time horizontal is space the black hole the purple black hole is the center and the boundary of the space is the light blue lines we perturb this but we perturb the system we perturb the system by acting with one of the fermion operators in other words putting an extra fermion at the boundary the holographic description is in terms of the boundary description the result is to create a little perturbation which might be a couple of fermions one fermion but one fermion can't split into two so let's start with two fermions those are the two little red wiggles and that corresponds to applying the fermion operators to the thermal field double state what happens well what happens is very similar to what happens in quantum field theory perturbations begin to split they begin to evolve creating more and more particles which on the boundary move away from the boundary in a sort of um, perturbation which grows away from the boundary the single fermion or the pair of fermions evolves into one fermion three fermions nine fermions it grows exponentially the number of uh, quanta grows exponentially with time and the operator gets more and more complicated the heisenberg operator with time gets more and more complicated the average number of quanta is called the size of the operator so the size of operators tends to grow it's another example of a tendency to grow what is the size of the operator what is its holographic dual the holographic dual of the size of the operator seems to be con closely connected with the radial momentum of the bulk particle which is created by the perturbation of the boundary in fact in detail due to work of lin maldesena and zhao we found that the precise relationship between the size and the momentum is simply that the time rate of change of the size is equal to the momentum somewhat similar to the statement that the time rate of change of position is equal to momentum but we don't take that seriously right now this was worked out by uh, henry lin maldesena and uh, ying zhao and i you know i recommend to look at that paper also look at the paper that i wrote with my colleagues the duality between momentum and size uh is a conjecture 
but it's a conjecture which is well supported. So I'll describe that a little bit. Oh, incidentally, of course, if you take another derivative of the size, that will give you the time derivative of the momentum, which has another name. It's called force. This sort of looks like Newton's equations of motion. Some acceleration on the left is equal to a force on the right, and that can actually, some substance can be put on that, but for the moment, let me just say what's known. The size in SYK can be calculated. It can be explicitly calculated. Here's a formula for it that was given by Chi and Stryker. Beta is the inverse temperature of the black hole. J is a coupling parameter, and T is just time. The size grows. It grows exponentially after a while. It begins growing linearly, and then it grows exponentially. But if we take Stryker key calculation and differentiate it to compute the momentum, we find that the evolution of the momentum of the particle, the momentum of the dual particle, grows exactly as it should, precisely as it should, if it were a particle moving in the gravitational field of the near-extremal rising Nordstrom black hole. So there seems to be some close connection between scrambling, which means the growth of operators, and the acceleration of a particle in a gravitational field. I would say that gravitational attraction is a manifestation of a very general quantum mechanical tendency, the tendency for operator growth, also known as scrambling. In many ways, this idea is quite similar to Eric Verlinde's idea that gravitation is entropic, but in this theory, it is not entropy, but really it is complexity or operator growth which is controlling the gravitational force. So we can argue which one is a better theory, but I've told you what I know. Okay, I've told you about basically four correspondences. One is ER equals EPR. The left-hand side, ER, is a gravitational concept. Einstein, Rose, and Bridges. The right-hand side is a purely quantum quantity, entanglement. Incidentally, E, of course, is Einstein on both sides. R is Rosen on both sides, and P is Podolsky. Second, the growth of wormholes. Again, a result of the equations of motion of gravity, general relativity, parallels the growth of quantum complexity, a purely quantum concept. Any quantum circuit or any quantum mechanical system will become more complex with time according to rules which are parallel to the way wormholes grow. Third, traversable wormholes, which can occur, are the same thing as quantum teleportation. Again, the left-hand side, a purely gravitational thing. On the right-hand side, a purely quantum mechanical thing. The fourth example I gave was gravitational attraction and its relationship with the tendency for operators to grow. The tendency for operators to grow, again, being a purely quantum mechanical concept. Okay, now, how is this idea of silicon shells with physical systems being represented by the states of the silicon shell, how is it different? Is it different than, let's say we decided to simulate in a quantum computer or in a crystal, we decide we're going to try to simulate the standard model of particle physics. Gauge theory, standard model of particle physics. We create a crystal. If we're clever, perhaps we can make the crystal lattice represent lattice gauge theory, maybe SU2 cross SU3 cross U1, and simulate the standard model. Alice, again, can communicate with the crystal. She can tap on it. She can listen to it. And she can communicate with what's inside the crystal. If the crystal is a good simulator of the standard model, there could be people on the inside, or cats, or quantum computers, or just hadrons, or whatever, and Alice can find out. In fact, she can then, having discovered 
is life inside this crystal or physics inside this crystal she can in principle open up the crystal and look inside and see the things or at least see evidence in the quantum and the quantum mechanical correlations and so forth of the things that she thought she was communicating with so in some sense there's nothing new about quantum simulating uh, a world and then going into it opening it up and discovering that world is really there what is the difference the difference is the following if Alice takes her shell her holographic shell and opens it up she finds nothing on the inside all of the physics is represented on the shell itself and the ability to describe a world a bulk world that she will not find if she opens up the shell but she will find if she taps on the shell and communicates with it all of that is a pure manifestation of entanglement complexity and quantum mechanics so I think uh, we are in the process very much so of changing the paradigm I think a real paradigm shift is occurring and um, I'm glad to say we're right in the middle of it and um, I thank you for your attention now,
Can you try it out? Yes, do you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? All right, so my answer, answer to, uh, to the question is the following. Think regular space. Think of ordinary flat space time, but with regular coordinates. In other words, hyperbolic polar coordinates. Polar coordinates for hyperbolic polar coordinates. I can introduce a time variable which represents a boost. That time variable flows forward on the right hand side, backward on the left side. I can study such transformations, and I can study how systems evolve with them. I can also introduce a global time which flows upward or flows forward on both sides. That's the time when I speak about time, I'm speaking about that global time which flows upward on both sides. The boost symmetry is an absolute symmetry of what I call it. The global forward time motion is not a symmetry of black hole, and that's why the black hole evolves under it. That's why it grows under it. So well, this is just this is just a, two different coordinates. You are introducing coordinates which are really boost coordinates. I'm studying the time evolution in a way that would actually correspond to the time evolution to entangle black holes in the same laboratory. Same thing, clocks being used to, uh, uh, to uh, think about or uh, to monitor both black holes. Both clocks go forward and they represent the global time revolution uh, and not a boost. So that's my answer to the uh, question. To, uh, That means your Rindler diagram moves forward in time altogether. Then the horizon doesn't stay at the same place. So I think that will cause great difficulties in your picture. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm not a black word for us to discuss it. That I don't think we can uh, really resolve this here. Um, is Juan there? He's coming to Juan, are you there? Tomorrow. I'll just tell him that he's coming tomorrow. No? Oh. Yeah. no. Juan, another subpoena, are you there? <laughs> oh. Sebastian. No, Juan, Juan is not here. He will come tomorrow. Oh, yes. He's not here right now. Oh, we come tomorrow. So I think that um, yeah, that's one because there's no way that I can do a picture on the blackboard for you, and there's no way I think that we can sensibly um, sensibly argue this. Penrose diagram is a diagram I should like We can slice the Penrose diagram, and we can evolve the black hole. Black hole will not be stationary under this operation. Keep in mind, black hole is not stationary under this operation. 
Penrose diagram does not have concrete translation circuitry, and the lack of time set translation circuitry is exactly the phenomenon I was speaking about, namely the growth of the quantum complexity of the dual quantum state of the two shell lines. So, uh, the horizon, the, uh, what, what changes with time is the separation distance between the left horizon and the right horizon. There's a point at the center, which is a point of minimal complexity, at which point the two horizons touch each other, and then they evolve. So, um, don't think of the black hole as being set. There's no time translation of the black hole under this kind of time translation. Anyway. Thank you for that. We are going to the next question, if there is one. Hands up. There's one over there. Okay. Hello. Well, uh, first, I think that you forgot to mention another feature in common between gravitation and quantum mechanics, and is that both uh, gravitation and quantum entanglement cannot be blocked, cannot be shielded from one kind of construct in the cage, unlike a Faraday cage. Anyway, my question is, how do, can you tell that uh, quantum complexity uh, uh, produces attraction instead of a repulsion? Ah. <laughs> Good. Uh, um, you know, I never thought about it. We just did the calculation of growth of the, uh, the growth of operators. We compared it with the gravitational attraction, and um, it's been perfectly. Uh, I need to think about it. Uh, um, I'm sure that it reduces the attraction, but uh, how I could have um, argued it from first principles, I have to think about that. Let me not try to answer it right yet. <laughs> Quick question. Any other questions? Over there. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Thank you. Okay, that was great. Hello. Um, well, here is a question from a 17 year old student. <laughs> so, I hope I understood it well, and maybe we can perform some kind of mental uh, well, experiment. Imagine you've got one wormhole and another one exactly perpendicular to it. And then you try to tell the front. Well, imagine you have, well, let's say wormhole requires two black holes. I'm correct, right? Yeah. Which are entangled. Yeah. Well, imagine you've got four. Uh, black holes organized in a square, somehow in spatial coordinates, okay. in such a way that these wormholes yeah. intersect with one another. Do you get the idea? No, they don't intersect one another. No, these wormholes are not. Uh, well, no, they don't get uh, each other. But how is it possible then? How can a uh, wormhole not intersect with, one, with another wormhole if, they, if these coordinates are well, perpendicular in space? Well, your picture, your picture is of. Two lines crossing each other, two lines in the laboratory crossing each other, but these lines, these wormholes, are not embedded in space the way that you're imagining. They're entirely, um, they're, I don't the right word to describe it. They are, they're not located, located in space the way that you're imagining they are. You can't see those wormholes from the outside. They're not embedded in the space in the way you imagine. There are simply topological features that, by no means, they have to intersect each other if they're going to connect points, which have to be organized in a laboratory on the square. That does not mean they have to intersect each other. So, I, uh, it's just a topological uh, feature of geometry that the boundaries, the holes in space are, are what shall I say, they are, are identified 
in a particular way that makes it tough for a topology with two handles in it. But the two handles do not have the answer. So this exact topology does not allow for the wormholes crossing in any way? Wormholes can cross a few set, but the thing you were saying, we just have two pairs of entangled black holes. Two pairs of entangled black holes, the wormhole will not get this effect. Okay, but imagine there is such a scenario. And then you have to share a more complex way for them to interact, or for them to intersect. Okay, and well, if they intersect in some way, what would happen if you were to send quantum information through teleportation, through these wormholes? And there is an intersection between those two. Wouldn't that give rise to some... At the same time, if you send quantum, if you teleport quantum information exactly at the same time, well, that's a possible relativity, then. This can be answered. This can be answered. The answer will be, it will be consistent, and you can analyze it in quantum mechanics. You can have four systems with just sharing entanglement in a particular kind of way, and you can answer what will happen, how a teleportation will work. I haven't analyzed it, but I would expect that it would work exactly the same for the wormholes. So, multi-party entanglement is a complicated subject, and surely, surely it has its own protocols for teleportation. I don't ever remember seeing anything about teleportation among multiple parties, but it should exist. I don't believe it's going to lead to any contradictions. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Susskind. So, I think that was the last question. I don't see any more hands up. So, please join me in thanking Professor Susskind again. Thank you for joining us, and we're going to switch now to the next speaker.